talking about superannuation today with our Matt Hearn from Findra, our money mentor. Now, I have lots and lots of super accounts and I don't know what or how to work it. I know what super is, but I don't know how to actually make it work the best it can for me so I can um, gain and work it as advantage in the future. But Matt, welcome. Thanks, Anita. Well, can I just <laughs> ask the first question with superannuation when it comes to it, where do you start? Well, you absolutely start by keeping your big picture purpose in mind. And what you're actually trying to do is the super is there because your employer is paying it in there. So what you want to do is make sure that when you get to the end of the day at retirement that there's as much there as possible. So the aim of combining your superannuation and choosing a more appropriate fund, for example, is totally about ensuring there's a lot more there. And to give you an example of what impact you can make by going through what we talk about today is a 1% net gain, so saving in fees or an increase in investment returns of 1% over 35 years can add $100,000 in today's dollars terms to your retirement savings at age 60. $100,000? $100,000. So if we can get you 2%, it'll be an extra $200,000. So it might seem like it's a long way away, but I bet you when you hit that day, and you probably will, $200,000 extra would be quite a sum of money. That would be very good. And you can't get that if you've got multiple um, accounts. Well, you might be inhibiting your chance to get okay. that. So the idea is if we can make 1% gain, you'll get an extra 100 grand over 35 years. Is there ever a time when it's beneficial to have more than one superannuation account? Yes. On very rare occasions, it can be. Um, usually it's for historical reasons, and that may be because you're in an em employer superannuation account superannuation account, you leave the employer, but you really need the insurance cover that they've got, um, so you want to keep that account, but then you go into your new employer's account because they've got low fees or better investment returns, for example, so sometimes a, that's a reason to do it, but that's very, very rare. But you'd already want to have quite a bit of money in there, because I know from experience I had three or four different accounts that eventually reached zero, just from uh, mm -hmm. monthly account keeping fees and your annual uh, keeping your account open fees. Yeah. Uh, if you've got less than sort of 500 bucks or a grand in an account, it'll just basically evaporate, won't it? Well, if you've got no good financial reason for it to be in there, actually, technically speaking, there's a law against it evaporating if it's less than $1,000. Oh, OK. So they can't charge you more than you earn. No, that's been in for about five or six years, if not more. Yeah, so it would have been a bit earlier than that. Remember, I'm yeah. old, Matt. Now, <laughs> the laws that changed about, what, three or four years ago that allowed you to nominate where your super funds go. Before, it was sort of like you work for someone, you roll all your old one into your new one. Are people taking advantage of that new law and maximising their income? No, in fact, Tuesday is the third anniversary of, of everyone, most people in Australia having that ability to choose where the superannuation goes and no the, the research shows that most people have still not made a choice there's more choice than others but most people haven't and I think it's because it seems overwhelming it seems harder than it is. Well, it really isn't that complicated, though, is it? I mean, and nowadays there's a Find Your Super hotline and there's all mm. sorts of government assistance to make sure that people are doing the most with their super. So do you think it's just apathy that pe stopping people or just lack of information? I think it's lack of interest. <laughs> stopping people oh, acquiring the information. So it's like that triangle I showed a few weeks ago where we had you know, time, interest and knowledge to do it. So it's a lack of interest in your superannuation. It seems so far away. But that's why I would like to emphasise that you can make a little difference now and it's easy to get that 1%, very easy. That's why I said 1% to 2%. It was very easy to get that extra 1% gain, and that's $100,000. Now, would you walk away from $100,000? No. No, you would no. not if it was something that was relatively easy to do right now. Okay, so what, what, where do we need it? What do we need to assess then? Okay. What are the key elements? There's lots of that? elements, but the key elements, the top four key elements would be start looking at the fees, and then, then you look at the quality of the investments within the account, then you look at the investment returns of those quality investments, and the fourth top element is the insurance premiums. Oh, that's a lot. A lot to look at? Yes. Yeah, and that's the top elements. The great thing about okay. the top elements, if you know the top elements, is it's easy to quickly filter all the funds out that aren't appropriate for you to look at. So it saves you a lot of time looking at ones that you don't need to sure. if you feel, if you focus straight on the fees. We see a lot of advertising out there, and obviously superannuation is big money. I mean, you're talking about mm. billions of dollars invested on behalf of employees around the country. Uh, industry super funds, are they that much more efficient as what they try to make out on the ads? Uh, it depends upon which element element you believe in a sense they um and this is a whole segment full of an answer really in a yeah. sense but in industry funds yes technically have a lower fee but what i find is on the investment menu quality they're not generally as broad now make there's exceptions of course which means that for say the average balanced investor they may be okay but if you're a more an aggressive risk tolerance i know i've spoken about that before and i crack yeah. the whip under your wealth often they don't have a v many aggressive investment options meaning that that may not be an appropriate fund for you on a value for money basis. Sure. Right, yeah. okay. Now just going back to what you were talking about was the fees that Jason yeah. was saying, 
what would be a good overall percentage that, um, well, for, for an average person to sort of focus on when we're looking at fees? Yeah, and it's good. Like, let's talk averages here in a sense. Yeah. For average, unsophisticated needs, you can really look for 1%. So if your total fee is 1%, and that includes, say, the account administration fee that the fund charges you, plus the investment fund charges you a little percentage as well, if you add those two together and you can get around 1%, plus or minus 0.1 to 0.2%, then that's a really good target. So if you're already paying 2% or more, which many people are, then you need to think, well, that's enough to make me think, well, I should move somewhere, because remember, we're just looking for that 1% gain. Mm. And of course Absolutely. the younger you are when you make those changes, the more benefit you're going to get from it. I think it's one of those weird scenarios where the young people can make a change and get better gain from it than what, what an older person can because obviously it's all about the years left to run. Absolutely. Now I've heard a term investment quality. What is investment quality? Really it's kind of what I mentioned before in answer to your industry funds. It's really making sure that the funds on the menu are the ones that are appropriate for you so it's almost like investment menu quality being appropriate and that's what it's about. So it's understanding your tolerance of risk which we've touched on before but we could do more detail later and knowing what sort of funds you need and making sure that they're good quality funds and not run by the backdoor operator in a sense. So they've got really good research behind them and long investment returns and uh, quality fund managers in place. So investment value for money then, is that basically a, a, about finding the best return or is it more complicated than that? It's only slightly more complicated because value for money is really are you getting more benefit for what it's costing you. So sometimes it's worth paying a higher fee if you're getting more and more benefit out of it. So it's okay to pay a 2% fee on your superannuation if the investment menu and returns are so much better that you're getting an extra 5% return. Sure. So it's not about the fee being below one, but if you're looking for a rule of thumb, look for one. Right. That's what I'm sort of saying, 1% investment. So okay. value for money is the real focus of this, of this exercise. Okay, then what about, um, you've got in here, insurance premiums. If we're yeah. talking about superannuation, superannuation, how does that actually come into it? Yeah, and it's one that people very much overlook, so thanks for asking about it. And it's really because most people in their superannuation will have a level of insurance. It's legislated that your employer fund has to have some insurance. And for many people, it's the only insurance that they've got. So sometimes, and I've seen this with employer funds, their fund is not that crash hot. It's not exactly low fee and the returns are pretty mediocre. Yet because of the size of their employer, the premiums are really low. So if they need insurance cover, then they, their low insurance premium is a saving of the fee that offsets the higher fee and the lower returns in a sense. So it's, that's why the value for money really comes into it. And because it's the only place that many people have insurance, it's something not to ignore. Mm, and again, over a long period of time as well, so mm. uh, small changes. Now, I've been, again, we'll get back on track in a second, but just noticed just recently in the, in the news we've seen um, people sort of being not tricked or misled per se, but for argument's sake, uh, I've got my car insurance. Now, if I'm with the same company for 10 years, I could go back and look now and find out that a brand new customer who's never insured with them before can get a better deal than what I'm getting. Mm. Is Super one of those sort of situations where you need to sort of monitor it every year or two or have, have a bit of a look and make sure that you're still in line with the competitors? I've not seen that particular circumstance um, where new people get attracted for certain big deals. They don't really see that. But yes, you do need to review your accounts and I think a really good trigger is when you change jobs. Um, it's a really good time to change your superannuation accounts. And then about every three years is another good chance um, to review it just because new products do occasionally come on the market. So a few years ago I wouldn't have said target 1% but now there is a quite a few funds that are under 1% they prov also provide really good investment returns. And are they sort of fairly transparent? Can you go online and the company will say well our average costs to have an account is 0.83 or, or is it that they sort of hide it away a little bit so you've got to do a bit more, bit more scratching. The reason I ask is because yeah. we spoke the other day about the triangle of knowledge yeah. and, and uh, you know, whether you should get someone else on board or mm. you know, whether you've got an active interest in it yourself. It seems that super, it's, it's one of those things every three years, I mean you should be able to sit down and do a bit of a mm. comparison, get a bit of a feel for it, ask a few friends and make a decision. But is it the sort of thing that you really would recommend that people get some external advice on? It can totally be done yourself if you are willing to invest the time to do it. So that's really what it can, can do. And we're in a very busy lifestyle, so yes, if you haven't got the time, then certainly outsource it. But it, by law, that most of the information has to be disclosed in what's called the product disclosure statement. So the information is there. It might not fit the criteria of transparent because so much has to be disclosed that it's now almost being information overload. Yeah. But it can be done by yourself, but because if you're not willing to invest the time in it, but you certainly want that extra 1% to $100,000 gain, 
then absolutely worth um, outsourcing it to someone. Like that's it's a worth. lot of money for your retirement as well. Well, it's a lot of money yeah. for your retirement. So you know, even if you invested one percent of that, so one paid someone one thousand dollars to sort out your super, it's a drop in the ocean compared to the exactly. hundred grand worth of difference that you could get.